Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce a man who needs no introduction in national and international immigration policy circles. He's an authority on immigration issues who, along with extraordinary, his extraordinary um, team of experts, has made the Migration Policy Institute the go-to think tank on immigration issues in the U.S. and abroad. Anyone who cares about immigration owes Demetri an immense depth of gratitude for his outstanding work on the topic and for continually providing critical information and policy-oriented research to the general public and policymakers. He advises senior governments and political party officials in over 20 countries, has chaired numerous migration committees, authored over 250 books, articles, and research reports. And I'm especially grateful to have him here today, given the timing of our conference and the prominence of immigration reform debates in Congress as Congress resumes this um, sessions this week. He recently testified before Congress, and his expertise is in higher demand than usual in Washington. So we truly thank him for flying down to Houston today. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Demetri Papademetris. Hello, everyone. The good thing about what's about to happen is that um, you don't have to think too hard. So you can sort of sit back and relax. Um, you will, um, what I will try to say is some of the things that the others have not talked about. Um, I like to um, raise some questions about, you know, um, uh, the enthusiasm that sometimes, you know, people feel about immigration or some questions about the unhappiness that people sometimes feel about immigration. And um, I will have to do so in, um, in a fairly short time because I have to catch a plane. <laughs> so <laughs> any questions you may have or any arrows you wish to direct at anyone, I am appointing Susan Martin <laughs> and Mark here, you know, from whom you have already heard, point them to them. Um, in all seriousness, thank you very much, Erica. You've done a terrific job. Uh, with this program, and um, uh, both um, Doris and I feel very privileged that we were here at the beginning of all this. In fact, as were several other people. So uh, congratulations. It is extremely important that um, serious people engage the topic with the seriousness that it requires. And. Um, you know, we don't always have an opportunity at the Migration Policy Institute to interact uh, too directly with the Academy, uh, but um, when we do, um, we always learn, and um, we're grateful for that. I will say things mostly about illegal immigration. Uh, all this enforcement that takes place all along you know, the enforcement continuum, not focusing uh, too much on any particular one. And then I'm going to say some things uh, that um, about, I think, the one issue that people probably understand least and or the least amount of real thinking is taking place, which is what Washington calls future flows uh, or what, you know, we have discussed in this room as employment-based immigration or work visas or whatever it is that uh, you want to call this. But if I can, if you will allow me to sort of walk back a few decades um, and take us back to the 1970s, which is the first time that increasingly systematically we started to worry a lot about illegal immigration. And I don't want to go down memory lane because the only person who can follow me on that is, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention any name, Susan. <laughs> You're welcome. You were, you, I, I will testify that you were an 11 year old precocious young woman at the time. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Um, but you know, this was, you know, there was already a gathering 
unhappiness uh, about illegal immigration. The numbers were not that significant. Uh, it became a political issue. Um, we, they had, you know, a big the organized labor which fueled that argument about illegal immigration. Had a very, very important godfather, a fellow by the name Peter Rodino, who was initially s uh, subcommittee chairman for immigration and then eventually chairman of the full committee. Um, the Ford White House got a little worried about it, so they, they did some work on that. And then, you know, the, the next president, Mr. Carter, appointed a commission that uh, the 13-year-old by that time, <laughs> Susan Martin, um, worked um, on with, um, you know, Larry Fuchs, whom we lost last week and um, uh, Father Ted Hesburgh, who was sort of like the go-to person in the 60s and 70s if you wanted a serious effort looked at seriously, as it were, on a key issue. We didn't do much. You know, we talked a lot. The commission produced sort of the first comprehensive what's what and what should we be doing about anything, what should we know and what should we be doing about anything with regard to immigration since probably 60 or 70 years before that. And uh, it's a compendium of knowledge that I think that, you know, people don't, um, don't refer to um, uh, frequently enough. And then in the 1980s, the topic became again, how do you deal with illegal immigration? But the focus there shifted to try to see how we might be able to penalize employers. So if I want to say that what in the 1970s was the main preoccupation, which is sensitize people that you have all this illegal immigration that is causing some adverse effects, or at least is making organized labor very upset. In the 1980s, the conversation was mostly about what is it that you're going to do about demagnetizing, in the language of the period, the magnet, which is job opportunities in the United States. And they came up with two or three ideas. I'm not going to bother with these. But most significant of those was that close to three million people, you know, got legal status, became uh, and got themselves on a path to green cards and then um, um, citizenship, which of course saw this extraordinary growth in Mexican migration to the United States. And it also increased legal flows to the United States quite significantly. You know, at the time, perhaps 86 or 90, you know, there were only a handful of Mexicans, for instance, who were coming to the United States illegal, I'm sorry, legally as permanent residents to join family or employers or what have you. Um, by the mid-2000s, that number was between 150 and 200,000. So legal flows, you know, of Mexicans to the United States increased dramatically. Now, what we didn't pay attention to or couldn't in the 1980s is how do we really do, how do we really import and implement what has always been a foreign concept to the United States? And I suspect that's because we're having such a hard time to deal with it. We call it employer sanctions. In other words, how do you make employers co-responsible, if not just responsible, for employing only authorized workers? And that's not an easy matter. We've now spent, you know, whatever, 30 years on this. We've gone through generations of ideas. I think you should ask, uh, you know, Mark about uh, the latest iterations of these ideas. Uh, but it becomes, you know, it still is today something that we're still struggling with. And it's one of the things that if we don't get right 
in this current phase of immigration conversations and possible immigration reform, we're going to pay a, pay a price which, in fact, is going to be paid in terms of more unhappiness in the near future rather than the distant future. And I don't think that the country can have another argument about immigration and make it even as uncivil as it has been in the last few years the next time around. It's going to be much more uncivil. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do something about was border controls. And indeed, the legislation in 86 you know, talked a lot about border controls. But really, we didn't start to have a, a, you know, a serious conversation with dedicated funds. That's what a serious conversation is in Washington. It's about, about money. Okay, You can have all the unserious or serious conversations you want unless you, know, you put some real money on the table, you might as well not bother. And it started sometime 1993-94, and since then, we've been putting more and more money um, you know, at the border. By the late 1990s, we started to think for the very first time, we had the very first task forces that included enforcement personnel from different agencies, not just the immigration agencies, Something, of course, that reached, you know, flourished and reached, you know, a very high level um, in the 2000s. So we get to the 2000s, and the 2000s a decade of controls, controls, controls. We haven't been able to do anything else. You know, immigration has been one of these areas where, in some ways, and I. You know, I'm going to be careful here. In a sense, failure is rewarded with more money. In other words, it is the only place, the border is the only place where you could say, if you give us today, if you give us another 300 million, million or 3 billion or whatever it is, we'll shut the border down. And then next year, you say, oops, we've made progress. But we need another five billion. I'm making the figures up, of course. That's what I mean by you reward failure with more money. But at the end of the day, 2013, I think the only thing that you can say, and you know, with all due respect to one of the very smart previous um, speakers and Peter Andreas, who is, you know, a good friend of mine and uh, a bit of, you know, sort of. A, collaborator and co-thinker in some of those issues a long time ago. You know, symbols, symbols matter, of course. The border control effort has gone well beyond symbols. And it's going to go as far as it will take. You know, I can build scenarios for you whereby we charge people who might legalize more and more money and the reflex action on the part of, of, um, of the Congress will be simply to take that money and dedicate it to more security, more jails, more this, more that. So this is the decade of controls all across the board, interior controls, um, um, border controls, et cetera, jails, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a bit of a ray of hope on something that several of us have asked intensively for the past many years, but only the last year or so we've seen the beginnings of that, becoming smarter in terms of enforcement at the workplace. We now have, you know, I guess the New York Times have dubbed it silent raids, is it, whatever it is. In other words, using technology from the 1990s to audit employers to figure out who does not fit within, you know, sort of a, a framework of what is, you know, a behavioral framework and try to sort of audit employers who are outside of the margins of that framework. And I think this is going to be, uh, uh, continue to be emphasized. I think that we're going to see um, uh, the emphasis, as it has already shifted, shifting even more toward employers rather than, than um, picking up uh, unauthorized workers. 
And I suspect that the sort of the, the vehemence or the attention that the government will continue to put on control in the workplace will only increase. And there are so many logical reasons for it, whether we like, we like that or not. You know, the most perhaps obvious is that you need to do that, politicians feel, in order to sort of break through the reaction or the negativity of some of the people who might vote for a legalization program by giving them a guarantee that you're serious about enforcing the law. And, you know, there have been an awful lot of people who have, in a sense, perpetuated, you know, they have they made it a, a matter of, of considerable, uh, if mindless, repetition uh, that the government is not willing to enforce immigration laws. And beginning around 2007, the government has reacted to it by basically saying, you think we're not going to enforce the laws? You think we don't like enforcing the laws? We'll enforce the laws and the, the, the laws on that, and we'll do it twice as aggressively as uh, we have ever done in the past. So if the last 40 years is, has been, have been a struggle about how to sort of deal with this issue of illegal immigration. Some of us, including me of course, think that, uh, and it's implied in many of the lectures that you heard and the conversations that you heard so far, uh, that the one thing that we ought to do at least as well as anything else in the immigration system, better I would say, is try to figure out how we can open up the supply of visas in an intelligent way. This way we can deal with some of the issues that Pierre was talking about. And that is complicated. And what makes it even more complicated, something I didn't hear, I've been only me here for two hours, I didn't hear at all, is that there is never a good time to open up to visas in the United States. And this is a particularly bad time to do so. And the bad time, I think, I hope, um, you see in the headlines when you look at what's going on in the workplace in the United States. And let me give you some data. And you know, I am sort of, um, I become a junkie of what is happening in the U.S. labor market, you know, since 2007, in fact. And an awful lot of people say, oh, you've been so negative, you know, and that was 19, 2008. And then they would say, oh, you know, this is going to change, and that was 2009. And now we're in 2013, there's still over 22 million people who are unemployed. The share of men who are not in the labor force is the lowest since the very first time that we started to count statistics in 1948. And 40 plus percent of the unemployed have been unemployed for more than 27 weeks. And very large proportions among them have been unemployed for more than a year. Let me tell you what happens when you have this kind of unemployed and underemployment, unemployment and underemployment, it's not just unemployment, and what this means, you know, for people who are, bare, who are barely making it, or they were leading, I know that in the United States everybody is middle class, I'm middle class, you know, everybody's middle class, but I, forgive me, I will sort of break that tradition and say lower middle class or working class because that's what we're talking about. Everything else is a euphemism. And my use of illegal immigration is, you know, a feeble attempt on my part to attack euphemisms, you know, on all of these issues. Um, people who have been unemployed for qu quite a while may or may not get a job. But when they get a job, they're going to get a job that's going to be a much lower wages and with many fewer benefits than the job that they lost. Second, 
if you happen to be over 55 or somebody trying to break into the labor force, in other words, a young person, including young persons with a college or a university degree, including young persons with a university degree from such an august institution as Rice, you are going to have a problem. Sometimes the problem is lifelong. This is called economics carrying, and we have evidence you know, from many different countries and the United States from the last time that we had serious unemployment problems in the early 1980s that it takes almost a lifetime to catch up with people who either never lost their job during a recession or for people, for people who did not get a job after they graduated. I don't need to be pedantic here, you know, because next year these people are competing with the latest batch of graduates, and the year after that with the latest batch of, of graduates. So there is a, a lot of hurt out there. Something else happens to people who haven't been able to get a job after they lost their job or haven't started their climb into the labor market. Their skills degrade. In other words, you know, it's not just that the employer only says, well, you've been out of a job for a year, year and a half. What I need is a slightly different skill set. I'm going to try to find them elsewhere is that unless these people actively keep their skills up, in the United States, you know, that would be heresy almost, an impossibility, but let's say. Um, when these people look for a job and they find a job, they find, you know, employers find that they can pay less or they then fire them again because no employer today, I should say almost no employer today, who wants to invest too much time and effort and money in upstealing workers for all of the reasons that smart people like you know and understand well. Okay, you don't want to have your employer, your good employee poached, you don't want to have to invest or pay whatever it is, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, and I don't know where this is probably the scariest of everything, one of the things that happens during recessions, particularly deep recessions, is that employers invest in labor-saving devices, technology, et cetera, et cetera. So they can produce more products with less labor than they did before the recession. This is already happening in the United States. So people say, how are you going to open up the immigration visa system, the work part of the visa system, to immigrants from all over, almost at all skill levels, if so many people here continue to hurt? And I don't have the answer to this, so please don't, don't wait for me to give you, you know, an answer. I'm just going to you know, sort of suggest, look at the analytical evidence, and I guess I'll suggest a couple of ways to think about it. So we know what's happening in the labor market. We also know that there are an awful lot of unknowns about people's behavior, people who are in the labor market, in the labor force, and people who are not in the labor force, that will determine what the supply of labor is going to be. OK? Let me give you some obvious examples. A lot of marginalized workers get disproportionately hurt during recessions. That's a global phenomenon. To start with, a lot of marginalized workers are not in the labor force in many places very frequently. You have all these two million plus what we call discouraged workers, people who have given up. You know, something you know, has to be done about that. You have the urban poor. If you look at unemployment rates, you know, in, in some of the big cities and not look at this unemployment rate selectively, you'll know that there are significant groups within these cities that have disproportionately high unemployment, even under the best of circumstances. And then there's old people like me. You're all younglings. There are old people like me who basically say, I'll probably have to work 
longer. Or if I retired, I had better be go back to work because I'm quite uncertain about what the future is going to be like in terms of benefits and Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. The collective behavior of all of these groups, women who left the labor force and want to come in, et cetera, et cetera, will determine to a very significant degree what the supply of American workers, by that I don't mean people who are born and bred, uh, I, I, but I don't want to use US workers because it will be meaningless to so many of you. Anybody who has a legal right to work here, okay? It will determine what that supply is going to be. And here you think that you may have heard the perfect case about being careful in immigration, and you may or you may not have. But we also know a different set of facts that in a sense go against everything that I've said so far, which is that an open economy like, like ours, an economy that can only thrive by being very open, whose firms can only, do, can only be the world beaters that we hope many of them are or will continue to be, need workers with certain skills, certain characteristics that they are not going to find in the local labor market. So there will always be need for workers, particularly at the middle and upper steel levels. And here, let me just uh, open a parenthesis because what I hope you will do in the afternoon, you will end expand your horizon and move away from this dichotomy between you know, low steel workers and high steel workers. In the future, the most likely action, if you will, in terms of immigration is going to be in the mid steels. Okay? If we don't understand it now, and if we allow, you know, organized labor to determine, you know, how many visas, 11,000 or 337 and a half, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was getting boring, so I had to do the half. <laughs> and, you know, are going to be among, you know, the kinds of things, including the trades, incidentally, which is, of course, scary. Um, we're going to need them all across the board. And I'll, you know, later on I'll talk about what Congress should not do, not only what it should do. And, of course, it's not only that. This is a big country. It makes no difference if you have 18% unemployment in New York. If you need a roofer in a Texas city, <laughs> okay, you're not going to get it from New York. There's always going to be, in other words, what we often call a locational mismatch or a geographic mismatch, as well as a, as well as a still mismatch. You know, today, employers, today, in today's economy, a very small variation in steels can have a big outcome in whether this worker is needed and the difference that this worker will make for his or her employer. I know in an ideal world, we'll just take people who have close to the steels that we need, invest six months in that worker, and they can do the job that you need. But in the world in which we live, a world during which in, in the past 20 years, we have told time and again to our best, most you know, successful corporate citizen that there is such a thing as a global labor pool and that they can go fishing in that pool. There is no incentive to do anything else except use a just-in-time understanding of how to get the steels you need. In other words, taking something from manufacturing and exporting it or importing it into developing or having the steels that you need at the time that you need them. That's the purpose of all these H-1B visas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to give employers that ability. So, as I see it, 
And as Congress is trying to struggle with these things, uh, I will be dismissive here. Hopefully there are not too many business owners or uh, labor unionists in the group. You know, I still laugh at the idea that somehow the next immigration law is going to be written on the basis of some sort of an agreement between labor unions and business interests. You know, uh, this is nice. It makes for headlines. I've argued with, you know, with um, newspaper types, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got a long road to go. And we're not going to allow two special interests, yes, you heard me right, special interests to define, you know, what it is that we should be doing on immigration as we shouldn't in just about anything else. So what are the three choices? And I'm sure there are more than three, but I will give you just three. Um, we can say Congress can do some modest things and they can fix them next year and adjust them the year after that and go back to them, you know, the year, six months after that. And after trying and trying again, basically get it almost right, whether it comes to how many, what skills, in what sectors, et cetera, et cetera. And if you believe that, you know, I do have this special bridge I brought from Greece that I can sell you <laughs> in place of whatever bridges you have here in Houston. Or we can do what we've always done. The Congress takes a shot in the dark, a complete shot in the dark, and says we're going to need 113 and a half astigmatic left-handed, you know, blonde, brown, haired, whatever hair color, red, whatever color hair you like, and, um, and that's it. Okay? That's, and they get those numbers exactly from where they get everything else, somewhere up in the sky. You know, I know that there are people who have tried to rationalize and justify after the fact how the numbers have come. You know, I've done this for 40 years. You know, you couldn't sell that to a three-year-old, okay? Or you can become serious about immigration, as serious about employment-based immigration as we seem to be about enforcement. And if you get to be that serious, then you're going to have to try to sort of follow a, you know, simultaneously a two, um, you know, two-prong approach to this. You have to start with a number and keep that number, make it flexible, but keep that number for two or three years. Flexibility can happen in a thousand, you know, we have ideas left and right. Pia talked about auctions, okay? Microsoft actually last September or October said that they were willing to pay $10,000 per visa above the ceiling and 20,000 if need be. Think of what happened last week, two weeks ago, whenever the beginning of April was. That's when firms petition, in other words, put applications in for new workers that will become available to them on October 1. Think about it, you know. Firm, okay, Microsoft perhaps can do that, but if a smaller firm has to figure out today, you know, what kind of steel set they'll need by October 1. October 1, they might be out of business. So, on top of that, these visas are limited in supply. So what do we do? Real smart immigration system. We do have just about the dumbest immigration system on earth today, okay? All across the board. I'm not gonna talk about family, I'm not gonna talk about anything. All across the board. So we're going to put all of these applications, pretend that a person who needs whatever in a mind power operation, okay, has the same need, urgency, as a person that needs somebody who will lead 
sort of the next whatever, you know, the next version of the iPhone or whatever. And we're going to put them all in the lottery. And we're going to throw, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I get exasperated. I'm not liked very much in some circles. <laughs> Uh, so, if we have proof that we can, you know, that we can show to everyone that we have one of the dumbest immigration systems on earth, how about if we try to do something, you know, that's a little smarter, and not be particularly, you know, bold, because bold in Congress. Uh, just, you know, there is a bit of a disconnect there. Okay? So how about if we start some processes that perhaps can lead us to something else? One of the things that we and my, and my colleagues and I are particularly fond of is beginning to develop the expertise that would gradually, over time, allow us to understand labor market forces, demand and supply issues, you know, people say, oh, it's going to cost so much to develop new data. Nonsense. Academics, you know, write PhD theses and books by, you know, <laughs> sending things to people and say, answer this questionnaire. When I, I worked in the Department of Labor 20-some years ago, five years ago, for four years, and I asked at that time BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, to do, you know, a vacancy survey. They molded over, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted $20 million. Of course, we said no. I bet you can get it for $20,000 today. More importantly, develop the instincts, the insight that gives you a sense of which variables, when they change, are most productive in terms of understanding what's coming up. And just in case you are wrong, because you will be wrong, Okay, have all sorts of things, escalators, you know, anything that you need. And now you can say, yeah, but should it be the 30 or 40 people, you know, who, that's what the business community says, dictate, you know, what we should do in our workplace? Absolutely not. There's a second and a third order requirement for creating such a body. And I'll sort of reduce it to just a few words. We as a country ought to be curious, much more curious about the effects of our policies on everything. We lack this most fundamental curiosity, and you can't get ahead in this world unless you have a little bit of curiosity. And indeed, and I didn't see Pierre's paper, but as I'm sure she demonstrated by comparing our system to perhaps Canada, Australia, you did what, Sweden, those, those kinds of places. Indeed, these countries are not just curious. They regularly, regularly change their systems on the basis of evidence of how well the policy is actually, in other words, is there a coherence? We're not even talking about a perfect fit between, between what we say the priorities are and what the outcomes are. So if we're the least, least bit curious, if we don't want, I certainly don't want, but many of you are young people, so maybe you don't mind having another argument about immigration you know, five or 10 years from now, OK? If we really want to do things slightly better, I would argue much better, we have to think differently about all of these issues. If we don't, and that's my last word, if we don't do so, we're going to pay another penalty down the road. And that is you know, the same. I would make the same case for legalization, how you structure it what you're asking people to prove, how much you charge people, et cetera, et cetera, to how you basically do smarter things at the border. I hope that we're past you know, the doing more at the border and move from doing more at the border to doing smarter things at the border. 
I hope that this hope will never materialize, that we'll need fewer jail cells. There's now an industry that has been created around jails and beds and all that. That's extremely difficult to, to reverse it. And, you know, hopefully, if we cannot solve all of our problems, maybe we can solve immigration this time. People are asking me whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic, and I say I'm probably realistic and fairly ignorant, <laughs> fairly ignorant about what's going to happen. Thank you very much. I can take some questions. I mean, uh, okay, let, me, let me check to see what time it is. Yeah, I can take about uh, seven or eight minutes of questions or comments. I persuaded everybody except this Hinojosa guy. What's going on? <laughs> I'm, I'm after you, man. I know, I know. Okay, so give us, give us the short version about how we don't know anything about what we're going to do uh, on the legalization. Um, what, 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 what's, the, what's the mess that we're going to walk into, and what, how do we uh, think of some of these problems? My biggest fear, and that's the only thing I can tell you, because, yeah, we get consulted all the time, and we testify all the time and all that. But you know, this is a rather closely held sort of a group of people. You get these phone calls at 9 o'clock at night, okay, and they ask you a very specific question, and you don't, <laughs> you don't have a sense of what the context. And I always start, where does this fit? And you get half answers, so I cannot tell you anything like that. But I suspect, and, you know, uh, I think both Mark and perhaps Susan, you know, can weigh in later on. Um, I suspect that people are finally attracted to the idea that you don't repeat the mistakes of the past on trying to disqualify upfront a significant number of people. So you are going to be inclusive upfront, and there are, you know, a thousand reasons for it. Okay, but then my sense is that. The requirements, it, it, you mentioned in your own presentation, you know, how long it's going to take. I have that answer. It's going to take a long time. There is no doubt about it. The figures are the president tried to, you know, sort of say no more than eight years. Uh, in the earlier stages in February, Durbin came back and says, well, ours will take at least 10 years. Rubio says 13 years. I suspect it's going to be 10 plus years, for the obvious reasons. The panel that I walked into, so I missed, did I, I didn't, I, that was the first panel, right? You know, so there were some terrific comments here about, you know, the power of Latinos, you know, how real it is, et cetera, et cetera. So I suspect that you're going to have, you know, a fairly open uh, system up front you're going to find the people to death, okay? This idea that somebody already, you know, raised a concern about the, you know, the back taxes, what does it mean? It's, you know, we have now, I mean, the whole immigration debate is full of, I have to be careful, I know this has been taped, so, uh, full of, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, full of things that don't have a meaning, you know, I mean, this back of the line, you know. The back of the line was created out of whole cloth, literally, back in the mid-2000s, when the president at that time was attacked that somehow he was going to give an advantage to the people who were here illegally over the people who had been waiting in line, okay? So, if the back of the line, which is now the accepted sort of principle, is four million visas. Even if the four million visas, three and a half, they are 4.4 million, but suppose a million of these people are really not real people. 
for a number of reasons. They're already here. You know, they've gotten to be 75 years old. If you're a Filipino, you, know, you waited in that line for 24 years, et cetera, et cetera. Suppose it's only 3 million people. Does anyone here think, and I hate to do this, but I will end it with a rhetorical question, that the US Congress will give 3 million new visas, 90% of which are going to go to family in order to eliminate the line, in order for these people to actually, I'm sorry. This is, I'm sorry, I'm, you can see, I, I don't want to be frustrated, but you, I hope you see the incredulity in my face, okay? So this is, you know, this field is full of things that don't really, you know, nobody thought about, politicians or even perhaps even more, PR, the, you know, the, the message creators, you know, probably have thought of those things. Ah, how about this? Well, now, these things, whether it's the end of the line, whether it's other things that you hear, we're going to have to deal with these things. That's one of the reasons it's going to take as long as that. But there are some positive things and I apologize if you know you are unhappy with what I'm about to say. There are some positive things that can happen during a longer period of incubation, as it were. I don't mean 13 years. This is a period of time that people can become prepared to survive and succeed in the United States. I'm sorry, though, you know, I mean, I don't see the same, you know, when I look at the data, and we look at the data very seriously. I don't see the things that you see. I don't see these great educational achievements. I don't see all of this great college. Women, for instance, of you know, Mexican background, et cetera, et cetera, register, go into college, but they don't complete college. And this is, you know, you have to really look at the glass the way it is, not choose whether to see it full half full or half empty. Unless you can persuade me, Joe, you know, someone in the street, you know, walk in the streets, that we're willing to invest in people. This way they can become successful members of our economy and society. You're going to have a hard time persuading me that we need, you know, many more visas at the low end or whatever else. This country keeps no commitments when it comes to our own people. And, you know, immigrants are our own people. So we have to be really opportunistic in terms of creating opportunities for these people to succeed. Because intergenerational poverty is a killer. So is anyone going to think particularly hard about these issues? You know, one of the things that, you know, that we seem to be doing all the time now, we have all these states coming to us. New York, you know, all the states that realize that legalization <laughs> will mean an awful lot more people, you know, that will require, that will have to sometimes, by the constitution of a state, access to benefits. You live in the state of Texas. It doesn't do very much for people. Okay? There are other states that do very much for people. That costs money. That money has to come from somewhere. I think these are the kinds of hard thinking and choices we all have to deal with. And this kind of a conversation here can be the very beginning or, you know, the whatever, you know, the opportunity to have these conversations. And I know that, you know, Erica, you know, when she produces something out of these conversations, will be, you know, an opportunity to start a conversation with people that matter in the state of Texas, both the state government, but also the delegation. These are extremely important things. Maybe you think that I think that they are too important. I don't think so. I travel the world all the time. I know who does a better job than us, which is just about most everybody, okay? Despite other severe handicaps that they have, which is, you know, 
handicaps about religion and all of these other things, you know, and how we do it here. We've got to be much more serious because at the end of the day, immigration policy basically changes the society. I wrote something recently, you know, and I've gotten a bit of a the flag from people, you know, as this and that and the other thing. But this is something that the government either allows to happen or, you know, makes the decisions actively to make it happen. This is all about change. And we have to manage change. It's about balance. We have to think through all of the pieces that go into a balanced approach to all of this. You know, the easiest way to draw even more of the benefits from immigration that Pia and a couple of other people talked about is not to have more whatever it is, more people with PhDs or whatever, is to try to reduce the negative consequences of immigration. In other words, you get more out of the system by making the system smarter. So, you know, a PhD, whatever it is, and I love the point that somebody, I think somebody made, maybe I made it up in my head, that um, the idea of stapling, you know, whatever, a diploma to people who have a degree and all that, I always imagine myself, you know, that there's someone here with a gigantic stapler, you know, and say, oh, green card, green card, green card, nonsense. We have the ultimate test of whether you're worth it or not. An employer who wants your services and is willing to pay for these services fairly. If that's the case, staple whatever the heck you want to. Otherwise, you know, I have an academic background. Many of you do here too. You know, not everybody, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, not everybody with a degree, let's just leave, leave it at that. <laughs> somehow is required to be employed. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I got to go. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to ask the, panel, the people in the third panel to please um, come up front. Thank you. Good seeing you all. And thank you for putting up with me. Tony, I think Tony can get the Tony? 
Okay. 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 Mark, myself, Stan, okay. and Mike. Okay. Ahora Ahora son son que lanzan, lanzan, sí. como lanzan eso. Ahorita lo ponen. Sí, no okay. sé, funciona automático. If you get those to me, I'll be sure that they get into proper archival form. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna get started. So um, um, our third panel is dealing with immigration at the local level. And I'm gonna pass it on to our discussant, uh, Beto Cárdenas. Beto actually wears many hats, and one of them is he's a counsel at Vincent and Elkins uh, law firm here in Houston. He is a, also a prominent voice in immigration policy and legislative process, and I'm happy to sit with him and with Stan Merrick in the Greater Houston Partnerships Immigration Task Force which Charles Foster successfully chairs, and we'll be hearing from Charles later as well. Also, uh, Beto, before joining Vincent and Elkin, served as the general counsel for Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Thank you, Beto. Good afternoon, thank you, Erica. So we've got a panel today that is gonna focus on really dealing with immigration at the local level, state and local level. We have four panelists here today. Um, to my immediate right is Tony Payan, uh, Dr. Payan is here at the Baker Institute, uh, followed by Mark Jones. Dr. Mark Jones is to his right. My good friend Stan Merrick, um, head of the Merrick Family of Companies, is to his right. And then at the end of our table is uh, Dr. Michael Olivas from the University of Houston Law Center. We're going to begin uh, with Dr. Jones, who has an analysis of different states and the actions they have taken on the legislative front. Um, then we will come over to Tony, um, who will give us more of a, a, a state response here in Texas, followed by uh, Mr. Merrick and then uh, Michael. So I will turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you. I'd first like to thank Tony and Erica and everyone else for putting together such a wonderful event and for y- y'all for attending. What I'm trying to talk about today is uh, what happened in the states, uh, particularly between 2010 and 2011. And this paper is uh, co-authored with Ben Cho, who's right there in the audience. Raise your hand, Ben, uh, so, uh, who uh, was an integral part to helping me get this along. But all heirs are mine, uh, and Ben there's no responsibility for them. Uh, and what we're looking at, though, is this uh, surge that occurred primarily in 2010 and 2011, uh, which were these state-level responses to the broken immigration system that was discussed quite a bit earlier today. That is, this uh, view by many Republicans that the system was broken, and a push, particularly among very conservative activists, to 
push the envelope a little bit, uh, in part out of local desires related to undocumented immigration in particular, and then also out of a goal to try to jumpstart things in DC. I think in the end, they in many ways were successful in getting this issue on the national agenda, but probably not successful in terms of how it came out in terms of partisan politics. And so, and we, as a result, we've seen in the outcome of this uh, uh, surge, uh, the 2012 election results, which have changed somewhat uh, the dynamics of immigration and have fostered in, as was dis been discussed, the prospects for actual immigration reform. So in many ways, in these, re these reforms, starting with Arizona with SB 1070, you can see almost the seeds for some of the reform we're seeing today. That is, this Republican overreach has created the conditions by which Republicans now feel that, at least among some of them, that they need to come to the table and address the immigration issue head on, as opposed to either avoiding it or pushing extreme options, which are politically likely to be very damaging in the future. Okay. Now, Tony's going to talk about this, so I'm going to just really briefly talk about Texas. It's the state I know well, the ex state of Coahuila y Texas, or, you know, which was, uh, but where immigration policy has changed. And just really quickly, in 2001, in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants was passed by a Republican legislature with virtually universal Republican support. Only three Republican senators and two members of the Republican House passed it. It was uncontroversial. Uh, Rick Perry signed it. Uh, even Leo Berman from Thailand, if you're a Texan and you've been following immigration for the past uh, decade, you know who Leo Berman is. Leo Berman voted for it, okay? So did Debbie Riddle from up in Tomball. Uh, Berman and Riddle, Fast forwarding to 2011, were the prom most prominent advocates of legislation to introduce SB 1070 legislation here in Texas, uh, anchor baby legislation, you name it. Uh, and, and in that 2011 legislative session, it took everything that the leader, Republican leadership could do to keep that legislation dampened down. Uh, they really did a bait and switch on the activists. They sold them sanctuary cities legislation, and then uh, essentially played it to such a degree that they made sure it didn't actually pass. So it took more work than they thought, in part because a special session appeared. But the Republican leadership, had it was a very tense uh, time for re Republicans in Texas. Uh, that, and then that takes us to 2013, where only two years later, we haven't seen any of that legislation. Debbie Riddle hasn't spoken a word about immigration. Lyle Larson you know, filed one little piece of legislation, but that's just because he wants to run to the right of Donna Campbell and become a senator. Uh, but you know, hasn't really tried to do anything with it. So we've seen a real sea shift in just a two-year period. Now, the omnibus legislation that we're looking at, sort of, there, there's been a lot of it uh, presented, the, but I think we can go back to Arizona and see this is the high point of it. This is when this legislation actually was introduced and actually passed in a very short period of time in 2010, introduced in January, passed by April. And it has, it's almost the full Monty from a, a, you know, a restrictive immigration reform. It has law enforcement requirements that requiring uh, law officials, I think you know, we're all aware, to if they stop somebody for another reason, to inquire about citizenship if they have reason to suspect the person is in the country uh, illegally. Identification requirements requiring people to carry documents that they don't have, thereby making sure that they actually are always committing a crime. Uh, reducing employment. Uh, restrictions on harboring transport. Really, this is the Chris Kobach uh, attrition to enforcement. The idea, make lives so unbearable, so impossible, so horrible that people will either leave or not come in the first place. Uh, that's you know, the overall idea behind the legislation. Uh, and what, in our study, we're looking at the N National Conference of State Legislatures, their definition of omnibus legislation, including multiple components like this, and then, all of the, and then uh, only those that were restrictive, which is the totality of them, actually. Uh, this, there was a, this really, there, there was a shot up with Arizona. This legislation was popular through t 2010 and 2011, and then you didn't hear any more of it starting in 2012. The last legislation was in Mississippi. Uh, it passed in the House, but the Senate leadership killed it uh, early in March. So there was, this is a very short-lived period of time, but for that year and a half, it occupied a centerpiece in terms of uh, national media coverage of the topic of immigration. And when, one thing we argued in the paper was one of the contributors contributing factors to the Republican Party's image problem. And I'll get to some of the evidence for that later on. 
Uh, but these are the states where it passed, Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Indiana, South Carolina, and Utah. Passed in one chamber, but not the other in Kentucky and Mississippi. And Oklahoma legislation passed in both chambers, but uh, died in conference committee. They couldn't come to a resolution of it. And it got late enough in the process where the Republicans it, were starting to realize nationally that this wasn't probably the best thing for their image uh, across the board. We also look uh, at uh, legislation that died in committee in Florida, where it passed out of uh, committee, but the Republican leadership in the House killed it, and in Maryland, where you had a Democratic-controlled legislature, and they killed it right off. All right, this is just sort of the idea of the omnibus legislation. All, one thing that they all have in common is this law enforcement mechanism, very similar to SB 1070. It varies a little bit by the legislature, but they all have some of it. Uh, they also, some of them have this ID, the idea that you force, you, you almost create a condition under which undocumented immigrants are by, breaking the law because they're carry, not carrying documentation, which they can't actually have or get. Uh, you also put uh, place restrictions on employment, the idea to cut jobs, make it more difficult to hire undocumented immigrants. Uh, some states reduce public benefits, meaning you have to show that you're a citizen or legal status in order to access public benefits. Uh, restrictions on rentals, harboring, uh, transporting undocumented immigrants, and then other requirements. Uh, for the analysis, we looked at the totality of the roll call votes related to undocumented immigration legislation, but in the actual analysis I'm presenting here, we only looked at the final passage vote or the most common equivalent, which is the last vote or the vote after which the legislative chamber loses control of it. Uh, this is, I've put up the states here. Uh, it's a pretty simple argument. In most of the states, this is a very partisan issue. In particular, almost across the board, every Republican in every state legislature voted for it. You have to go looking around, you know, 2% of Republicans in the uh, Alabama House voted against, 5% in Alabama. And these, when you look at the numbers, this is one person. You know, it's, these are relatively small bodies. So you're looking at one, people to, one person, two person people. Uh, so this, on the Democratic side, it's a little more mixed. You have cases like Indiana and over here, Oklahoma, where Democrats were on majority in favor of it. But in most states, it was pretty much a very split partisan issue. You had virtually unanimous Republican support for it. So the mean percentage of Republicans in these state legislatures voting in favor of this legislation, 96. 2% voted against and 2% abstained. Democrats, uh, you had 78% voting against. 20% voting in favor, and 2% abstaining. So pretty much, it's a, it was a very partisan issue, and it created this image nationwide of, on one side you had Republicans that were pushing legislation that was viewed as anti-immigrant, and by definition, anti-Hispanic, and anti-Asian American, which I was mentioned earlier in one of the panels that all of the things we're talking about that are viewed by Hispanics as anti-Hispanic are also viewed by Asian Americans as anti-Asian American. That is the anti-immigrant applies to both categories. Often, but often we just talk about uh, the Hispanic component of it. Now, in terms of trying to explain votes, it's easy uh, I, to look at other factors. If we're looking at other factors such as uh, uh, ge geography or race or ethnicity, for the Republican Party, there isn't much to explain. Every Republican voted for it. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, race and ethnicity, every Republican's an Anglo. So uh, you know, the 98% of the Republican legislators are Anglo, 1% are Hispanic, 1% are Native American. Now, it's not zero for African American. There's one re African American representative from Georgia in the entire population. But for the most part, you're not going to explain much looking at the Republican Party in terms of how, why, how, people, how they voted, because every vote, Republican voted for the legislation. And even if you wanted to look at racial or ethnic differences, there isn't any diversity to look at. So uh, you're pretty much set. Now, on the Democratic side, it's a little different. Uh, because as we saw earlier, not only uh, do you have about a fifth of the Democratic Party is voting in favor of this legislation, but at the same time, you have a much more diverse uh, population in terms of uh, Hispan Hispanics, uh, Anglos, and African Americans. So this is an analysis of the legislation. Uh, these are posterior densities or predicted uh, probabilities. And what the percentages are telling us is the percentage of people in that category uh, within the Democratic Party that are expect predicted to vote in favor of restrictive omnibus legislation. And this controls for state factors as well in terms of fixed effects. But the, the principal takeaway is that 
rural Anglos are the group that almost half, and you know, if you, those, those uh, bands are the confidence intervals. That is, the prediction falls somewhere between that band. Rural Anglos generally voted, are almost as likely to vote for it as against it. And generally, you can use, at least here in Texas, back when we had uh, rural Anglos, which we don't have anymore, better off, you're probably more likely to find Bigfoot in the piney woods than you are a conservative Democrat in Austin. But uh, when we had them, they tended to be, our conservative Democrats tended to be in the rural areas. And that's the group that was generally most uh, supportive of the restrictive legislation, far more than, say, both rural and urban African Americans. And not significantly so, but noticeably so more even than their ur urban Anglo counterparts. So there is quite a bit of variation within the Democratic Party. And to the extent to which there is support for a more restrictive legislation, it's uh, in the conservative Anglos, these blue dogs, uh, but that are in uh, increasingly short supply as we go throughout the country. Now, you know, that, what did one of the effect, what was one of the effects of this? And this has been repeated, I'm not going, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But this comes, all of this helped create an image that led to these problems that have been mentioned regarding the Republican Party. That is, Mitt Romney did worse uh, than recent presidents, um, uh, recent Republican candidates among Hispanics. Arizona, this is, I think, you know, a telling statistic. This is the uh, presidential vote in uh, Arizona for Republicans. For, so George W. Bush, John McCain won, uh, Bush won 43, uh, McCain won 41 percent, Mitt Romney drops to 22 percent, whereas Barack Obama went from 56 to 77 uh, percent, while the, at the same time the Hispanic share of the electorate increased from 16 percent in 2008 to 19 percent. And this isn't a favorite son aspect of McCain. Actually, Romney did better among Arizona Anglos than McCain did. So, I mean, it's even actually worse if you think about uh, uh, the result. So it's this type of thing that has Republicans very worried because uh, the, 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 in many ways, Republicans are putting a rock in a hard place because if the immigration isn't resolved, then these sorts of trends are going likely to continue. And this issue remains on the front burner. It's going to be used against you. And your support among Hispanics is only going to decline. Uh, and you're going to get things like this, where you have states like Nevada, Arizona, California, you know, that are down in the 20% range. This is Latino decisions data. I'm not so sure about Colorado. It always seems a little low to me. But that the Republicans did that, and Ronnie did that poorly. But in any event, these are bad numbers if you're a Republican. Everything's going in the wrong way. And even Texas is now starting to come, you know, potentially in play if uh, the Hispanic uh, share of the vote won by Republicans to, continues to fall. Uh, you know, you can always say, you know, in terms of the importance of Texas, Mitt Romney could have won every swing state, but if he'd lost Texas, Barack Obama would still be president. You know, and that shows you the importance of Texas and the idea that if this trend continues, the Republican Party has no future. But that, that's one side so for the Republicans, but it's almost, it reminds me of Ghostbusters, I'm sort of dating myself, where they're forced to choose uh, the, the form of the destructor, and it ends up being the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Republicans are forced between fighting this and then continuing to lose Hispanic vote share or allowing a large share of the population who, if they behave like naturalized citizens, don't vote Republican. Uh, so naturalized citizens vote much, uh, much more Democratic than second, third generation Hispanics. So, you, so the U.S. average is 18% for naturalized citizens versus 27% for U.S. citizens. Here in Texas, 18% uh, for naturalized citizens, 34% for U.S. born. So from a Republican perspective, uh, you're caught between if you don't change things, you're just going to continue to decline uh, in terms of your vote share among Hispanics, and the presidency is going to eventually be, go out of reach. But if you reform uh, and allow particularly citizenship with a relatively short window, then you're going to create a large population that odds are aren't going to vote for you. They're going to turn out and vote uh, Democratic. And if we believe the socialization literature, uh, a lot of these people uh, who are at this age have already made up their mind about uh, part their partisanship, and that's going to be really tough to change. So you've created a situation where you're choosing either or. I still think from a Republican perspective, you're better off getting it off the table and spending the next 10 years or 12 years working to change your image. Uh, but it's still a very difficult situation. That's one of why, the reasons why you're going to have trouble getting things through the House. So uh, I'm going to stop there. But... Uh, 
uh, you know, in terms of the 2000, the, I think the, one of the lessons we came from this legis the state level legislation was it was a big overreach and it was a move, it was a move by state level activists and particularly linked with conservative activists nationwide to move the agenda. They were able to move the agenda, but not in the way that they probably hoped. That is, they weakened their party and the image of their party nationally and now have strengthened the hands of moderates in DC who are going to try to push through legislation, which is going to be probably legislation that a lot, a lot of them don't like. That is, it's going to be pretty far from their ideal uh, policy, particularly those that truly believed in the, in the legislation and weren't using it for political reasons at the outset. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, to follow up on uh, on uh, let me set my uh, clock here. Uh, to follow up on on Marx, I uh, kind of delve into the case of Texas a little bit more to try to understand what is going on in Texas because, uh, unlike the more recent trends in other states, uh, Texas has actually uh, been quite moderate uh, in terms of uh, immigration. And so the question for us, the puzzle is, uh, if Congress is failing and the failure of Congress to pass immigration reform in the country is uh, creating a kind of an uneven field in which the states, the state governments and the state legislatures feel that they have to respond to this issue. Uh, and you have some extreme cases like Arizona with SB 1017, 2010, and then you have some very generous legislation like in, uh, in Maryland or in California that are very immigrant friendly. Uh, and, and, and then in the middle, you find Texas. But Texas politically uh, shares some of the characteristics of Arizona, where you have large numbers of Republicans. And if you look at the, uh, the numbers in the, in the House and in the Senate, in the Texas uh, House of Representatives and the Senate, you will see that it's kind of counterintuitive. So, I think we need to kind of explain what is going on in Texas and what is possibly making Texas sort of stick to the middle in spite of the, the political character that Texas still uh, has and has had since the 1990s. Uh, the, um, uh, so I think that in some sense we need to explain that. And part of that also is puzzling not only because Texas is a a, a Republican state or a red state in character, and in fact, uh, uh, the Democrats in the last election won only uh, 26 of the 254 counties. Harris County was one of them. So you kind of wonder, well, if the Republicans are able to keep 230-some counties and lose only 26, obviously this is still a red state. The Republicans are winning it by a margin of 40 three to 54, 55 or so. So clearly this is a, a solid red state. And yet, and also the, the other aspect that we have to add to this particular paradox is the fact that Texas is the uh, passageway for a lot of the immigration that comes from uh, Mexico, but also Central America, because a lot of Central Americans take the shortest route, which is along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, and then they try to enter in Texas. So Texas has clearly a border issue with immigration, with undocumented or unauthorized migration. In addition to that, Texas is the second largest recipient of undocumented workers. Uh, the low ball estimate is about 1.7 million, and the high estimate is 2.2. Somewhere in there is the truth. Uh, there's different estimates everywhere. So having this, uh, being half of the border with Mexico, uh, being a solid red state, and having a, a real uh, problem with uh, uh, both being a passageway as well as a destination for undocumented workers, why has Texas been so relatively moderate as opposed to Arizona, which shares some of these characteristics and, uh, and uh, not quite as liberal as, say, California, which is also a border state, or Maryland, which has been quite, quite generous uh, to a large extent. Uh, what I do is I take uh, some three uh, different aspects. One of them is to take a look at the data 
uh, the legislative data uh, from the 2009 and 2011 legislative sessions. As you know, Texas is a biennial legislation and uh, meets only every other year. So uh, I took a look at the bills introduced and I tried to sort of whittle them down to just those bills that have to do with immigration and figure out what happened to those uh, bills. In the 2009 legislative session, uh, there were uh, what I consider essentially five immigration-related bills uh, that were introduced. Four were introduced, sorry, three were introduced by Republicans and two by Democrats, and four of the five failed. And the only bill that passed was a bill, the description for which reads, relating to the creation of an advisory committee to establish and recommend qualifications for certain health care translators and interpreters. So the bill that passed was actually a bill that would provide uh, translation services for migrants who do not speak English. That's sort of also very counterintuitive. And the other four bills that are related to law enforcement and, and IDs and such didn't pass at all. And so that in and of itself, I think, kind of requires a little bit of an explanation. If you look at the next session, the 2011 legislative session, there were seven uh, bills that passed and seven that didn't pass, 14 of the bills that I analyzed that were introduced. And the ones that passed were one that had to do with prison budgets and the idea of uh, how much prisoners were costing. Uh, it literally reads, relating to certain mandatory conditions of parole and mandatory supervision for illegal criminal aliens and the revocation of parole or mandatory supervision is a resulting uh, a result of violating those conditions. Uh, the other one that passed was one that required applicants for residential mortgages to submit a completed application that states whether they're legal residents or not. So it has to do with mortgages. Uh, and the, the next that passed has to do with deputizing customs agents to enforce state law. So it's a little bit more of a law enforcement component, but it's really sort of deputizing federal agents as Texas law enforcement. Uh, the other one that passed was relating to reporting concerning inmates who are confined in county jails, essentially a kind of a uh, safe communities uh, bill that uh, uh, require county jails to begin reporting the uh, uh, documented uh, status of Uh, uh, prisoners, uh, people that were detained in county jails. So that's a little bit more towards law enforcement. And the other one finally had to do with driver's license and the idea of demonstrating um, uh, effective uh, residents in Texas. So relatively speaking, they were rather mild. They didn't have the omnibus character, the punishing character of some of the bills that Mark uh, talked about in, in Arizona, in Mississippi, and Georgia, and Alabama, and Utah, and other places in South Carolina and other places in the country. So that in and of itself is sort of a, a, a puzzle that we have to explain. The other thing that, that we have to explain is uh, the 287G agreements. The federal government in 1986 had this uh, particular purse designated for as an incentive for law enforcement, local law enforcement, uh, to obtain funds so that they could collaborate with uh, federal agents to enforce immigration laws, a, a, a sort of deputizing uh, local uh, county and, and state police as uh, immigration agents to enforce immigration laws, and in exchange they would get a number of, of uh, material incentives for doing that. Interestingly enough, in all of Texas, and we did a kind of a, my interns and I did a kind of a search on the internet for these agreements, and only three local entities in Texas made such agreements. They were uh, two suburbs in Dallas, Carrollton and Farmers Branch. Farmers Branch is a well-known kind of radical small town, 20,000, 22,000 people live in that suburb. Uh, And uh, Harris County, the Harris County Sheriff, not Houston, the city, which went the other way. So there were only three. And in Texas, you have almost 5,000 local governments when you consider counties, townships, cities, and and, and other entities that govern uh, the state. And you only had essentially three governments, local governments willing to sign 287G agreements. Uh, in addition, though, uh, uh, the a lot of the cities in Texas, well, 16 of them, uh, and, and what is intriguing here is that it's the, the largest of them, and I'm talking about uh, Houston, uh, San Antonio, Dallas, Austin, 
uh, the largest cities and, and um, 12 other cities, among them some of the largest in the state, uh, pass sanctuary um, uh, city uh, um, uh, resolutions, which means that they declare themselves sanctuaries for undocumented workers, and they, uh, they instructed their local police not to enforce immigration laws, or at least not to communicate with ICE the, uh, the, uh, on the immigration status of their detainees or the people that they stopped in the city within the limits of the city and such. So that's kind of the, uh, the opposite direction. In addition, and at the statewide, it has to do with the, with the tuition. The University of Texas system, which is where I work at, uh, in, in specifically at the University of Texas at El Paso, but, but certainly it's a case with the entire system, uh, no questions are asked. As long as the, um, the uh, individual has a high school degree from some high school in Texas, they get accepted to, to the university and no questions are asked. They, uh, they are accepted at the university. So that's kind of a, a very mild response uh, overall by, by, uh, by Texas. Uh, the other thing that sort of is, is puzzling in Texas, and I'll try to throw some, some explanations on this in a minute, some hypothesize on some of the potential explanations. Oh, uh, I wanted to um, uh, tell you the numbers uh, in the state legislature so that you understand that if the Republicans in Texas had really wanted to act in the way that their colleagues acted in many, many other states, they could have done it. In the, 20, uh, in the 81st legislative session, 2009, uh, the Republican Party uh, held uh, in the House of Representatives a majority of 76 to 74, uh, and in the Senate, 19 to 12. In the 82nd, uh, the 2010, after the 2010 election, the 2011 meeting, uh, the uh, uh, majority increased and the Republicans had 101 and there were only 49 Democrats. Uh, the Senate stayed the same, 1912. So clearly the, the Republicans uh, essentially control every statewide office uh, and, uh, and the state legislature. So if they really wanted to do it, they could have done it. And yet they held themselves and they decided not to do it. It's, it, it's, it's sort of a... Uh, a theoretical or, or sort of an empirical puzzle, rather, that deserves some a explanation. Um, also, the other uh, interesting thing that I think it's easier to explain is um, uh, Governor Perry's own attitude. We haven't been quite belligerent about Texas, uh, uh, the, the Texas border security and having appealed to and chastised the federal government uh, to uh, assign more resources uh, to Texas and having called in the previous sessions 09 and 11 uh, for uh, tougher enforcement of immigration laws, having uh, um, uh, the party having supported a bill to eliminate sanctuary cities, to essentially forbid local governments to pass sanctuary cities uh, resolutions. Um, the, uh, in, in the end, in the 2013 legislative session, which is uh, which began this January, uh, there has been hardly any mention of immigration. It's a topic, a subject that is completely absent from the rhetoric. It's completely absent from the bills that are being introduced. So there's absolutely nothing in, in, in there that you can say, well, some. Of course, it's very easy for us to, to um, uh, appeal to the idea that the 20 12 elections sent a message to Republicans and that they, the Republicans are beginning to understand that they cannot continue to alienate uh, the, Repu the um, Hispanic vote for many of the reasons that Mark explained. But that's kind of an easy explanation and it doesn't really hold because Texas was already quite moderate from before the November 2012 elections. So there have got to be other explanations. Also, the Republican Party is, I think, and this is uh, part of the explanation, because I'm running out of time in a minute. Uh, it, it probably has to do with the fact that in Texas, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Hispanic presence has had probably a moderating effect on the political uh, landscape in Texas, and it has probably been sending earlier signals to the Republicans that, he, that they have to pay attention to this particular electorate. And in fact, the Republicans have made it already an effort in advance to recruit more Hispanics uh, uh, to the Republican Party. So clearly there was already uh, a pre-November 2012 understanding that the Hispanic uh, vote matters. 
And, um, and also, I think th that was reinforced by the numbers in Texas. I mean, Obama did get 71% of the vote, Hispanic vote in Texas, in a state where 38% of the population, 38.1, I think the la last number I saw, is, is already Hispanic. So clearly, they've been reading the writing on the wall well in advance of the 2012 election. So that cannot possibly explain uh, Texas, uh, the, the, the moderation of Texas. The final thing, or at least one of the last things I will share with you is that I think in Texas, the Republican Party is really not that simple to understand, and it has at least two wings. One of them are the more con socially conservative, more nativist uh, wing of the Republican Party that has made its, its home in that particular party. But there's obviously a business class, a different elite, that a more moderate, traditional Republican group that goes back in Texas probably to the 60s and 70s and understands the importance of immigration and the importance of having an economic, uh, a dynamic economic environment and, and probably a good understanding of the contributions of immigrants to that economic dynamism in Texas. And so the Republican Party itself is pulled, tugged in two directions, and that creates a more moderate political environment when it comes to immigration. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. No problem. Good afternoon. Erica, Tony, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me as a token businessman to speak at this group with all these PhDs in academia. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm just an Aggie that barely got through school. But uh, I'm, I'm in the construction business. I am a business owner. I have a payroll every Friday, several thousand men and women. And uh, immigration is very personal to me. Uh, my grandfather was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia, settled in the little town of Yoakum, just outside of Schulenburg. Uh, uh, started his farm, had three sons. Uh, during the Depression, lost everything, basically homeless. The three boys and grandma and grandpa moved to Houston in 1938 and started in the sheetrock business, putting up this stuff. Uh, did well, then the war broke out, all went into the service. After the war, they came back, restarted the company, and with the, uh, their cousins and relatives from the farm from Schulenburg and Yoakum and Shiner. And I'll never forget my dad, um, I was six, seven years old, he'd come home complaining to mom and said, you know, I can't work at German boy with that pole boy, they fight the whole time and the only good workers we got are the Czechs like us. And you know, it was, it was a very racist thing back in those days for a, a young lad of seven and it's amazing how we all assimilated. But we were fortunate as many Houston businesses, the post-war boom exploded, Houston exploded. Our little company was started with three brothers and cousins and nephews, now has about 5,000 employees in eight cities. And uh, after the Immigration Reform Act of 86, the only change we had in our employment was hiring with an I-9. We had to have a ID and a social security card. And that's all we were ever told to do. And uh, uh, we had unbridled immigration. You know, that little Social Security card, it was easier to get in the flea market than it was from Social Security and the driver's license. Everybody could get a Texas driver's license. And immigrants flocked because there were jobs. And we needed these immigrants. And it was tough for this Czech boy who didn't speak good English to sp learn Spanish. You know, but if you wanted to work Latino employees, you had to learn a little bit about Spanish. But we integrated them into our workforce. Fast forward to today, the University of Texas just finished a survey they interviewed 2,000 construction workers around the state of Texas, El Paso, San Antonio, Austin, uh, Dallas, and Houston. Over 50% of the almost 1 million construction workers in Texas are, guess what, undocumented. Over 500,000. That's a lot of people. We have 2 million estimated undocumented in Texas. One-fourth, 25%. Think about restaurants. Think about landscape. Think about uh, rest, uh, uh, janitorial. We have a lot of undocumented people that quietly do their work. Well, how do they do it? Okay, fast forward. 2006, and Charles, is my general counsel, is not going to like me to talk about this, but a man showed up in my office with a big gun on his hip and ICE across his back on his wind windbreaker. It wasn't the ice cream man. <laughs> It was Immigration Customs Enforcement. I said, Charles, what do I do? It's my first call. You got to show them your I-9s. So we took out all these I-9s. We laid them out and everything. And about three weeks later, this nice agent comes back and says, Mr. Merrick, your I-9s look beautiful. Every guy's got a Texas driver's license and everybody's got a Social Security card. But about 100 of these workers, 100, 
their name didn't match their social security number. Wow, what am I gonna do? Well, you're, you have no problem, Mr. Merrick, but you have to terminate those employees. I said, wait a minute, those guys have been with me 10, 15 years, I've, I've trained them. You know, they've got hospitalization, 401k, vacation, holiday pay, I know their kids. I'm, you know, I sponsored Little League Baseball team. Sorry, Mr. Merrick, you have to let them go. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as a business owner, is to call those men in one at a time and explain to them why I was terminating them. I followed those men since 06. They're all working, every one of them. And they're doing great work for my competitors. <laughs> you know, they didn't deport them. They knew they were undocumented. And this hadn't happened to just me. It's happened to hundreds of companies in Houston. Hundreds. But the disappointing thing is these men today, with the little downturn we had three years ago with the subprime mess and et cetera, et cetera, most of them are working for cash. They're working as independent subcontractors with no insurance, paying no taxes, not because they don't want to, because that's the system. And if you take those 5,000, 500,000 undocumented workers in the state of Texas, most of them are working on projects like maybe this apartment project right down here on Shepherd. Maybe some of the schools your kids go to school, go to, go to school in. Because the way it works is a general contractor hires me, I can go hire Jose, and I can take all the responsibility by calling Jose an independent subcontractor, sending him a 1099, getting him to sign a waiver of comp, and he's on his own. Now that's a wonderful system if you want a really cheap product because nobody's paying any taxes. And most of your construction workers in the state of Texas, over 50% are working in that system, and they don't want to. So what we want to do is legal status. They don't care how long the legal status is. They just want to come out of the shadows. They want to go to work for a contractor that, excuse me, pays and matches taxes, provides some benefits. And, you know, how does this happen? We have these huge government agencies, wage and hour, uh, Department of Labor, Internal Revenue Service, Texas Workforce Commission, three different agencies police those workers. And when I go to wage and hour, well, man, you know, our budget's cut. We can't do all the investigation. I know it's all going on. But you bring one of those guys in, bring one of those guys in to, to testify against his employer, and we'll jump right on it. And I say, oh, yeah, Jose's going to come in. He's illegal. He's not paying taxes. He's going to come ask the government for help. No way. No way. So these workers are basically being held hostage. And it's not going to change until we get an immigration bill. And the one thing, all of you academics, we got to put in the bill, hear this, hear it well, when that bill comes out, it needs to say that that worker, this W visa, whatever you want to call it, has to work for an employer who pays and matches taxes and provides workman's comp if he's hurt. Because if we don't do that, employers will just say, okay, you're not my employee, you're an independent subcontractor. And with Obamacare coming out pretty soon, think about it. Why have employees? You know, you get, you get you know, I know huge projects going on in the city where half the workers are undocumented and nobody's paying taxes. And the owner, the owner is the only one benefiting from the cheaper price. Think about that. Now, this University of Texas survey is online at constructioncitizen.com. It's a website we started for our industry. It really gets into a lot of detail. 60% of those workers do not have workman's comp. If they're hurt, they go straight to the ER, they're fixed up, sent back out, and we pay for it. Citizens, taxpayers. That's not right. 60%. Texas is the only state in the nation that has, does not have mandatory workman's comp for construction workers. And we're trying to get it through the legislature. We're trying to get a misclassification bill through the legislature. Are we getting any support? No. No, there are groups that want to leave it like it is. They don't want to deal with reality that we have 500,000 construction workers, much less a million and a half other workers in other trades that are basically being taken advantage of. It's time to stand up and do the right thing. And I'm, I'm happy that, uh, Erica, you put this panel together. There's a little rally going on at Fondren Library with a workers' justice group at 6 o'clock if you want to join us over there. I mean, this is a serious thing, and, and, and it's not going to go away. And the, 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 the terrible thing in all this, as I really get into it, and, and, and you can tell I'm a little emotional about it, is that we have a bunch of kids every year graduating or dropping out of our high schools that aren't going to go to college. 
This one track for all does not work. It's a miserable failure. Tom Pawkins says it well. We need to create craft, vocational jobs for our kids that aren't going to go to college. But the problem is construction, when I was growing up, that was the trade you went into. It was a good trade, maybe $3 an hour. But, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a something you could learn, to learn how to use these and learn something that was portable. Well, today, those jobs, as you know, somebody's working, you know, 60, 80 hours a week with no overtime, working by the piece, not by the hour, no benefits, no career path. Our kids aren't going to go into those jobs. But those jobs need to be available for our kids because you take a kid out of high school, he drops out. If he doesn't get a job, where's his next stop? Huntsville, prison. And then we spend billions of dollars rehabbing those kids. So uh, this immigration bill, and I hope the gentleman who was here at 1 o'clock is, he was a little negative, and he's been through the wars, as Charles and I have been for the last six years. It's going to be a fight. I mean, there are a lot of groups like Numbers USA and Fair USA that are just flooding your mailboxes and your emails with negative propaganda about this being another amnesty. It's not. I mean, we, it is a de facto amnesty because we're not doing anything to help these 11 million people who are here now. It's time to you know, get serious with our elected officials about demanding that they do something positive about immigration reform. Thanks. Now our next panelist is uh, Dr. Michael Olivas. It's uh, just too difficult to stand. I am taking it like a man, however, which is badly, uh, <laughs> with, with a lot of whining and crying. Um, one of the things I, I probably should have made clear in our, in our histories here was that I'm a board member of the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. So that uh, when I hear Texas being described as a moderate place, I, 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 I have to sprint. I, even I can't walk, but I've got to sprint because Maldiff uh, continues to keep the state honest. What, you're do what they've been doing, Tony, for the last couple of years is redistricting. <laughs> they've been engaging in stripping the school system of money for, the, for, for these kids. Uh, and it's not every kid that gets in uh, under the uh, top 10% plan. It's only the top 10% that gets in. It's not, it's not every kid. Um, and, and it's now because it worked so successfully at UT Austin, it's now down to the top 7.5% plan. Um, that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is in the beginning there was deferred action. And it has come back um, with a vengeance. And it is the um, model, I think, for much of what could happen in um, legalization. And because it has given us 75,000 students who were undocumented in Texas, who are now in legal status, and who are not in unlawful status any longer, uh, it's important to talk about the roots of, of um, deferred action under its new acronym DACA, um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, uh, largely intended for sojourner children whose parents brought them here. Uh, which reminds you, has to remind you that it was Texas that in, in the late 70s uh, lost the case of Plyler versus Doe um, to uh, charge, uh, when, the Supreme Tex when the university, excuse me, when the U United States Supreme Court said that they could not charge a $1,000 tuition. So uh, Texas has a long and honorable history of, of anti-Latino for the most part, certainly anti-undocumented behavior, it's become more mooted lately, largely because it's won on most of these, and it's, now it's got uh, a large group of, of, of workers that it can exploit, um, such as was just noted by Stan. But um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work to do, and, and uh, I think that uh, everybody's letting these guys get off far too easily. Um, there is a lot of perniciousness, and the fact that they've kept the crazies from from lighting fires on the hill doesn't mean that they aren't acting crazy much of the time. Uh, and Maldiff goes to court regularly to correct this, and we win far more often than we lose, including Perry versus Texas, the redistricting, the other kinds of things that, uh, are, that count a great deal. But as for prosecutorial discretion, the roots of this, uh, interestingly, are John Lennon. John Lennon was the very first person who took advantage of what was then called prosecutorial discretion in the early 1970s 
and sued successfully uh, to have his case, which was a, a hashish hit on his record for which he was going to be removed from the country, to have it removed and, and simply put to the bottom of the file so there would be prosecutorial discretion in not pursuing his case. It was what he called and his lawyers called invisible law. And since that time, and actually before that time, but never on the books as, as much as it has been since uh, the 1970s, prosecutorial discretion included a grounds called deferred action. Now, the reason you didn't know about it very much is because it was virtually impossible to get. You couldn't apply for it. It could be given to you only through prosecutorial discretion in the last gasp of a removal procedure or someone who is about to be removed, usually with citizen children, and so in a humanitarian gesture, they, they might be allowed to stay. But very few people were given this, and, and because it did reconstitute you, it froze you in status. It wouldn't allow you to become legalized, and you couldn't marry and, and become a citizen or do any of the other kinds of things, so you had no avenue of relief available to you, but it, it did preclude and freeze your removal, and it constitutes being in lawful status. That particular point means that states such as Texas now allow people to get driver's license, for example, if you have deferred action, because so few people could get it before, and they were all virtually all humanitarian uh, with long-time um, uh, residents in the state. That, that they had it on the book. So when, when uh, President uh, Obama uh, issued his DACA rulings um, in plan, Governor Perry, first in line, says, we're not going to have that. Uh, we're not going to give driver's licenses to these undocumented people. Well, what he didn't realize, of course, was that they're no longer undocumented for that period of time that they're in status. And moreover, they already had on the books statutes that gave driver's licenses to per persons with deferred action. So that Persons who get deferred action under this childhood arrival, this DACA status, now in Texas can get driver's licenses. In contrast, let us say, to Arizona, where the day that DACA became available, Governor Brewer signed in law uh, that they would not recognize deferred action for this purpose. Now, uh, I will tell you that we were in court. We've gotten this um, uh, temporarily enjoined. And we, will, we will win, and we will get lawyers' fees on this because lawyers, uh, state lawyers and governors don't get to say what is a federal status for immigration purposes. Our doctrines of preemption and uh, uh, other doctrines, uh, the constitutional doctrines, do not allow states simply to make up their own immigration law, any more than Texas was allowed to back in 1982 with Plata versus Doe. Now, it also will allow some persons to have employment authorization. And um, with the, as of December 2010, the DREAM Act was dead. It had been vetoed. Um, uh, early on by, by the unwillingness of, of the, the Republicans to give President Obama, who had just gotten his health care enacted, they did not want to give him another uh, uh, victory. In, and so persons such as Orrin Hatch, a well-known liberal, um, who had introduced a well-known liberal, <laughs> Senator Hatch, is there a bad connection? Maybe I, should, should I limp over to that microphone, perhaps? <laughs> he had introduced legislation called the DREAM Act early on in 2003. Even he didn't vote for it this time. And so President Obama, uh, because a lot of these DREAM Act kids were outing themselves, and in the, in the honorable civil rights tradition, all wanted to be Reverend Martin Luther King and go to Birmingham jail and be... Uh, be outed in, in uh, themselves, even at some risk, I might add, to their parents uh, at the time, uh, whose parents will, their parents will not get any form of relief under DACA or any other provisions. Um, uh, it'll, it'll be up to comprehensive immigration reform and the registry provisions uh, for them. But uh, so he, in, in uh, the spring of 2011, he began what's called the Morton Memoranda, which gave deferred action to a broader form of persons. What they did was they went back and reviewed the 400,000 cases being, uh, uh, of removal that were being undertaken, and he granted deferred action to about 300 DREAM Act kids who were caught up in that system, although only half of them got employment authorization, and none of them got permission for Social Security numbers. 
Uh, but they were allowed to stay in the United States as long as deferred action was given to them. Well, on the 30th anniversary of Plyler versus Doe, that is June 15th, 2012, President Obama announced that he would start this program called DACA within 90 days. And sure, sure enough, it was up and running within 90 days. And these students have come forward, and by the way, as of last Friday, there were 500,000 kids who'd come forward, almost 3,000 a day. And not one of them has been turned down yet. They have to have been in the United States for a certain period of time. They have to have met criteria. They cannot have criminal records, including what's called a serious misdemeanor. Um, they have the biometrics. They pay uh, a fee for this matter. And when immigration relief does come, they will be at the very front of the line because they've already been cleared. They do not have criminal records and because the government will know that they've been here and they will have that special status. But until that time, they're simply frozen. Um, these are the same people that, that uh, Governor Romney wanted to self-deport, uh, urged them to self-deport, even though they had been allowed to stay in the United States by the Supreme Court decision of Plyler versus Doe. But as you know, Plyler versus Doe did not apply to college. It was, as was shown earlier, uh, um, legislation signed by Governor Perry very generously in 2001. He was the very first governor to sign it. As you saw in the Republican primaries, he did pay for that very seriously 10 years later when they all held him as being too liberal. Of course, as, as I said at the time, even a stopped watch is right once a day. Um, <laughs> because he, even a stopped watch is right once a day. Twice a day. Once a day because he tried to send the Texas National Guard into Mexico the next week to quell gun violence there. So as so I took that back. Um, but the point is that since that time, tens of thousands of undocumented students in Texas have not only received in-state tuition, but financial aid. But they still found themselves unable to hold jobs, to get licenses, to be employed, to get social security numbers, to be in deferred action of any sort that would even allow them driver's licenses. And so we have students like them now who have graduated and taken state bars in California and Florida who have sued in both of those states, and I think in California they're gonna win. The guy in Florida has been turned down because he received DACA in the meantime and therefore was able to, to proceed. But we will have undocumented lawyers on hand. Charles, think of the, the challenge to the profession when that happens. But they've already navigated professional moral uh, character and fitness all the way through in the states, those two states, uh, historically quite restrictionist, uh, have, uh, uh, have urged that both of them be admitted to the bar. We will have undocumented teachers. We will have undocumented uh, medical doctors in the state. I've had four research assistants who've been undocumented, but they could not work legally, but DACA now allows them to do so. And I think that these are the kids that we have to pay particular attention to. And as of last week, 75,000 in Texas had cleared this process and received deferred action. Now. The problem is that, as was suggested earlier, Republicans and restrictions generally have overplayed their hand. So that in Arizona, um, they, which that, that Arizona legislation, by the way, in, in my view, uh, the Supreme Court gave them three Fs and an incomplete. They struck down the three major provisions. Uh, so when you say omnibus legislation, it's true, but the next step is that much of it has been struck down, including MALDEF, because we are there, to try and keep these guys honest. They have overplayed their hand, but simply pointing that out doesn't do any good. We've had to take them to court. We did so in Alabama, where they drew, they wanted to keep out undocumented college students. They drew it so badly that they would keep that, they were keeping out persons who were refugees and asylum seekers, people who have legal permission to be in the United States. So in Alabama v. HICA, which stands for <laughs> I forget what the, the, the game was, a HICA, a Hispanic Interfaith Coalition or something. Um, they, they struck this down, and so the state had to go back and rewrite the provision because it was so badly drafted. Uh, in New Mexico, the governor has tried to take away driver's licenses from the undocumented, which would put more unregistered persons uh, driving. Uh, in Utah, it is true that they had an omnibus legislation that singled out workers in particular, but they carved out a provision for undocumented college students. So at the same time, there's been this 
national nativism and restrictionism that's really quite palpable and is largely anti-Latino, in my view. We're, we're not trying to keep out undocumented Swedes, let, let, me, let me just say. <laughs> Although they come here with their ABBA music. Uh, the, the one reason I'm not for open borders is, is that Swedes come here and bring ABBA records. <laughs> And then Abba gets in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, how, how can this be right? They have overplayed their hand. Fifteen states now uh, allow undocumented college students to get in state tuition. So in addition to the longstanding Texas provisions, Colorado and Oregon last week signed. Utah carves out this special provision, as did Nebraska, as did Kansas, as did other Oklahoma, other states where you would not expect this. And so on the one hand, there's been demonstrable, I believe, anti-Latino animus that has led to the, this terrible explosion of legislation and, and, and its concurrent press back of litigation, where we're winning as often as we lose. Now, I can understand Arizona. They share a border with, with Mexico, if they're afraid of Mexicans. But Alabama, they, what, they, they, they share a gulf with Mexico. So it's occurring, this hatred is occurring in places that it's not even necessary and it's completely unexpected. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done and, then, and it's true that we captured the narrative of sojourner, innocent sojourner children. That was, that was convincing, and it's been upheld to this time, and I think remains the law of the land, even though it's been challenged by, by Republican restrictionists uh, in, in California, where they lost after Proposition 187, and where the Gallagher Amendment lost, where they wanted to try and do this at the federal level. They have simply lost each time, and yet they come back and present themselves not with hoods, but with more moderate activities such as redistricting, stripping the school systems, uh, and and engaging in, in the other and not allowing driver's licenses even when DACA would allow them to do so. Seven states have tried to do that. We're gonna win each one of those cases. It is necessary to be vigilant to not let these guys get away with it because they're simply painting the fact that they're not frothing at the mouth doesn't mean that they're moderate because these activities hurt. 30% of the school children in Texas are white. 30%. And yet we have to go back every five years and sue the state successfully for having an unconstitutional uh, school law, school finance law. And we do it and then they pony up and they pay us attorney's fees and then they don't do it. They allow other practices that continue, I believe, to be anti-Latino and anti-public school. But it's important to understand that with all of the overarching nativism and with the, the uh, ugly attempts in the media to portray most Mexicans as either lazy or as aggressively stealing our jobs, decide right now which of those ugly metaphors you want to use. You can't have them both. I mean, either I'm stealing your job or I'm lazy, taking my siesta, listening to ABBA. <laughs> As a final matter, I think that DACA has given us many clues about what a successful inculcation of these kids and in, uh, how we could, in fact, uh, move them more readily into our society because it has been generous, it has given them social security numbers, it has given them uh, opportunities to make their presence known and leave the country and then return lawfully with, per with advanced permission. All of these things look exactly like 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act. And uh, I believe that these dreamer kids who made their voices, their articulate voices so clear, who graduate as salutatorians and valedictorians in our Houston school district and then discover that they can't get federal financial aid, these, are, these kids are our future. These are our children. These are not kids who are yet to come over the border or who, who will come over the border. These are our kids. And we have, we, every year we deport 
many families who have U.S. citizen children, tens of thousands of these people. It's not just the wives, as was suggested this morning, and more often it's the citizen children who are deported. And in two actions defended by Republican governors, one in Florida and one in um, New Jersey, citizen children whose parents were undocumented were held to be, by state policy, held to be ineligible for, federal fin for state financial aid. Simply U.S. citizen children with birthright citizenship born in the United States whose parents were out of status. We have never ever gone after undocumented parents of citizen children to say that because their parents are out of status that somehow they get an asterisk on their backs that they are ineligible for benefits for which all other citizens we settled this in chinese cases in the 1800s and yet has been revisited by republican governors and republican administrations who continually act as if we're not gonna, they can get away with it, that we're not sophisticated enough or smart enough or aggressive enough to go to court and sue them and win. Well, they were wrong in Plyler versus Doe and they're wrong again today. Thank you, Michael. So I, uh, have a couple of comments to make, and I always love to just kind of go back and reflect whenever I am asked to make comments, whether it's uh, before an audience like this or on television or anywhere else. I, I laugh about that 1992 vice presidential debate where Admiral Stockdale got up and said, who am I? Why am I here? And you, know, you kind of go, okay, why am I here? I'm here to kind of give some comments initially and then uh, back on some of the um, presentations that were made and then open up a dialogue and discussion. It's great to be back in an academic setting. Uh, Erica's right, I wear many, many hats, but before I uh, uh, worked in the federal government, I worked at a university at Texas Tech and was counsel to the chancellor and enjoyed academia, primarily because both of my parents were college professors and they never really thought they would have a son go to law school. They wanted me to go into a PhD track, um, but I like to talk. And so that was a little different. It's good to be here with Mark Rosenblum. Uh, Mark and I worked in the uh, United States Senate back in 2006 during the Kennedy-McCain Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill. And what we saw there was that moderation wasn't a bad thing. Um, I think the federal government is really known for rarely taking a step forward. It doesn't look into the future. It does not propose legislation to look into the future. And we can see that. Um, based on the fact that the health care reform uh, legislation in 2009-2010 actually left out undocumented persons, those without legal status. It's a tradition that actually was not too far-fetched. In 1996, welfare reform legislation ensured that anybody that did not have documented status is ineligible for any federal benefit, some of which Michael referred to. So what ends up happening, states and local governments actually take up the burden. And this often includes law enforcement systems, our public schools, our hospital districts, use of public infrastructure. But yes, taxes are actually paid, and economic benefits do expand with population growth. Rarely do people want to see a decrease in population. Um, now, my role, whether it was as general counsel to Senator Hutchison or advising clients, is to find solutions. Um, doing otherwise, in my opinion, puts us in this spiral of endless philosophical debate none of which we saw here on our panel. But we really have to look at a couple of issues when we look at immigration policy, some of which you heard today. And that is, where is America's strength? Nobody negates that immigrants bring strength to America. But in Houston, we find solutions. At least that's what we'd like to think, based on the fact of that famous line, Houston, we have a problem. Not so much a joke, we find the solution here. And so how do we get to that solution? Pretty much just as we always have, we find the measure of our strength based on those we include, not ex exclude. So I'd like to comment briefly on some of the um, presentations that were made, first of which was by uh, Professor Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones, of course, showed us that moderation isn't really a dirty word. And um, one of the things to recall here is that a majority of the electorate, particularly the half that don't vote, 
don't particularly prefer the extremes. Um, the 2001 legislation here in Texas or the mandatory E-Verify signed by Governor Napolitano, um, which was affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Whiting decision, actually showed that moderation is acceptable. Um, and thirdly, I would say that um, when it came to the electoral, goal, uh, electoral statistics in 2012, we really cannot say that the Hispanic vote was a single issue vote. Um, there's education, there's health care, there's access to capital and markets, free trade, and in many cases, social <coughs> issues. So while it was shown in certain states that immigration could be an issue among the Hispanic electorate, it was not the only issue. It was actually a smart allocation of resources, particularly on the Democratic Party side, into a key targeted states to do pretty much what was done in 2004 by Karl Rove and the Republicans in Ohio and other states, and to drive out the turnout and base. This was um, not a surprise to many in the, uh, those that follow electoral politics, but it was quite frankly a result. And to negate that fact, of course, you have the anomaly in the Republican Party, uh, which is the last time I checked, Ted Cruz, senator from Texas, is Hispanic. Marco Rubio, Hispanic from Florida. Governor Brian Sandoval, um, out in the far west, along with Governor uh, Susana Martinez. And in Texas, you had Hispanics grow in the Texas State House of Representatives. Um, so you did have growth in political strength. Um, to my friend, P Professor Payan, I would uh, say that it was interesting when SB 1070 passed in Arizona. And so what I bring to the discussion that you, you really enlightened us with is politics. When SB 1070 passed in Arizona, the first words from a gubernatorial candidate did not come from a Democrat. The Democratic nominee hemmed and hawed and thought and debated with his staff. I know this only because of their friends of mine. They kept trying to think of what to say. And instead, Governor Perry came out with a brilliant statement, said, well, that law isn't right for Texas. Now, he didn't tell you what he was for. He just said, that law isn't right for Texas. And he left Bill White pretty much with tire tracks all over himself um, over issues that involved the lack of a 287G agreement here in Texas and others. Um, I would also say that um, one of the interesting things in Texas was Governor Bush. Governor Bush in 1995, February 1995, one of his per first public remarks that he made after becoming uh, governor of Texas was focused on education. He made these remarks um, in South Texas utilizing Plyler v. Vido, which uh, Professor Olivas brought to our attention. And he said education is, in Texas is fundamental. It should not matter where you were born, what you look like, what your last name is, or who your parents are. Something that was totally different and something that endeared him to an electorate. I would also say um, Professor Payan brought up the 287G agreements. We do have one here in Harris County, Texas. Um, it is one that transcended both political party sheriffs, Adrian Garcia and his predecessor. And part of why we only have three uh, entities, law enforcement agencies, that have those agreements are rooted in cost and responsibility. In order to attain that agreement, somebody has to bear the cost. You have to train your officers. You have to end up having an expense to that. But you also have to have a political pressure point that demands from the population that agreement. And in Houston, we don't have to look too far into the situations which brought that forward, um, the tragedies of police officers who were killed. Now, let's not joke ourselves. Police officers have been killed by citizens just as well as non-citizens. The in-state tuition issue um, that was brought up by two of our speakers, uh, I'm often reminded by the fact that the law it does not distinguish between citizen and non-citizen when it becomes um, an issue of tuition. It's resident and non-resident tuition. Uh, universities charge their rates based on residency, not on legal status. Um, and that is done because the taxes that are paid, particularly in states like Texas, are property taxes, sales taxes, and other consumption taxes. So that is why that ends up uh, being the case. For my friend Stan Merrick, uh, there is no question that business leaders often don't have a choice when it comes to how the uh, law is enforced. They have to end up 
making a choice themselves. And so I would um, uh, state and add this into the discussion, many times business leaders have to engage in politics in order to um, advance not just their agenda, but the greater good. There shouldn't be a punishment to doing business in our country. That has always been a philosophy that has carried us forward. But unfortunately, um, when it comes to immigration, the politics do get involved in business. And so business leaders have two choices. One, they can accept uh, what comes their way, or two, they can get engaged. And the way they get engaged is either through education of their fellow citizens and their politicians. And sometimes that includes their wallet. So I don't, uh, I'd don't. like to know, obviously, how many talks Stan has given, because they um, obviously outnumber the years I've been on the earth. Uh, for Professor Olivas, I would um, not necessarily disagree with the substance of his remarks. However, I would bring up two critical points. Um, and it's just one out of the, that are facts out of fairness. In 2006, the Democrats swept both houses of Congress. In 2006, before that election, comprehensive immigration reform passed under Republican leadership in the Senate with a majority of Democratic votes. Immigration enforcement legislation passed in the House, but they were never reconciled. In 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, for four years, the Democrats held the House of Representatives, and not once did they bring up the DREAM Act in committee, out of committee, or to the floor of the House of Representatives. It wasn't until they lost the election in 2010, in December of 2010, they lost the November election that they brought that forward. And in the Senate, in 2007, October of 2007, this will bring me to my second point on those remarks with deferred action. In 2007, there were alternatives proposed to the DREAM Act, one of which I was privileged to help draft. But it wasn't until 2010 that a, another vote came up on the DREAM Act. And that tally was 55-41. And while it may be said that the overwhelming majority of Republicans voted no, had the Democrats, as they did in health care, stuck together, they would have actually gone well over the hurdle of 60 votes. One senator, Democrat, decided to go to a Christmas party and not show up that day. Five senators. Ben Nelson, Mark Pryor, John Tester, Max Baucus, and Kay Hagan decided to vote no. Had they voted yes and had the Democrats stuck together, the DREAM Act would have been law. So I think it's unfair to blame one party or to give all the credit to the other. That might be a better statement. But the, my second point to Professor Olivas' um, presentation is this. Deferred action in 2007 and subsequent to its enactment into our policy was said to be a very evil thing. What was even more evil, we were told, were alternatives to immigration reform bills that were filed. Because if we did not have legal status that included a path to citizenship, we were told that was second class citizenship. And so my question would be, is not deferred action even worse? Because you provide the undocumented immigrant a false hope of being able to stay in the country without legislative solutions going forward. In my view, that is not necessarily cruel, but it is a temporary solution, one that does not actually gain you a better status than that which we have seen in the civil rights legislation, which occurred over time in incremental steps. We didn't get civil rights legislation on day one. It started with a small civil rights bill, Voting Rights Act, other enforcement acts, and obviously what we have today. So with those comments, I uh, would um, invite any of the uh, presenters to respond to some of the questions that might have been posed, but then we have about a good 15 minutes um, for questions uh, from the audience. So if there's anybody on the panel that wanted to respond to any of, of my comments or uh, the comments of others, I would invite that participation and not alternate to the audience. Well, I would just say that because deferred action is not perfect, doesn't make it bad. You know, I mean, it has given uh, social security numbers, uh, opportunity to work, opportunity to stay, renew it after two years. Uh, that's pretty good eaten by my lights, I, I, I've got to say. And uh, when you combine that with the, uh, you know, the, op the movement now toward comprehensive immigration reform, um, but, but to, to, count, to count those names to say that if they'd turned out everybody 
that that uh, it would have been enacted. Well, yes, Senator Kennedy was was having brain tumor surgery. Um, McCain was nowhere to be found. Um, uh, the guy from Pennsylvania, who was a Republican at the time, later he walked. You know, the White House put out an announcement that they that that enacting uh, the Dream Act would derail comprehensive immigration reform. There's plenty of blame to go around. I mean, I, sure. uh, that is, that is certainly true. Um, uh, but but to to say that deferred action is not worthwhile because it's a holding pattern. I mean, you know, God, what what would you have them do? Uh, <laughs> I, I'll take if that's a loss. If that's a bad thing, I'll take that. <laughs> Honestly, I I get very few victories. Right. I'll take that loss. It, it's better than nothing, is what right. I've always said. But it's also selective. And so, if the next administration came in and canceled it out, and Congress did nothing, you'd find yourselves in a worse situation. Yeah, but that that did not happen. Anybody and else I, from the I, panel? I, and I don't think it will have. Shame on us if we let that happen. I mean that. That, that was one of the smartest things our president ever did was a deferred action. And, and I've, I've spoken to many DREAM Act groups at University of Houston and other places of students, like 400 at A&M, who are ecstatic. And for the first time in their lives, they have hope. And if that hope is taken away from them, shame on us. We, should, we can't let that happen. So to my point, I would argue that alternatives in Congress that provide legal status and not just a path to citizenship, but to provide that first initial step are practically identical to the deferred action result. And if we are plotting deferred action result, then we should applaud all alternatives that get us into a spot that's better than what we have today. That's my simple academic point. Questions? I would just like to make just one point on the Texas Republican Party. Well, Ted Cruz, I think, you know, is a very positive advance for the party. When you look at Austin, zero of 19 senators, three of 95 state reps, zero of 24, one of 24 members of the U.S. House, zero of six statewide officials. I mean, it's, the Republican Party still has a lot to do in that respect, though I think uh, Steve Munisteri, George P. Bush are really making some, and Jason Vialba are making some really positive moves. There are some, I, I think there are some things that, that also deserve explanation. And like, I, I gave some, I hypothesized some of the potential responses on the uh, relative uh, moderation of the, uh, of the Texas uh, immigration landscape. But I think other things, also deserve an explanation that I haven't seen really well explored. And one of them has to do with why is it that President Obama and the Democrats had essentially controlled of, uh, control of the uh, of Congress and the White House, and they, they didn't do it. So perhaps they decided to spend their political capital first on health care and other things, but they certainly didn't do it. And, and that's not the puzzle, that they decided not to spend some of that political capital on immigration reform. Uh, but why Hispanics gave them another chance by even a larger margin. So that, to me, it's sort of a, perhaps it's easy to say, well, mm. they don't have any place to go. I mean, the Republican Party is not welcoming them. But still, why didn't it just stay home? So to me, the, the, the attitude of, the, of, the, of Hispanics in the 2012 election uh, and, and their ability to, to give President Obama a second chance, even by larger margins, still needs an explanation. I'm going to go ahead and uh, open it up to questions from the audience. There is a microphone over to the right, so Mike Nichols has his hand up. Um, the, I'll the, the, frustra the frustration that the business people have, and I've been in the same position that Stan Merrick was on having to fire people, um, is that the politics in Congress has not done anything. This uh, back and forth, whose fault it is, and the Democrats didn't do it, is really worthless to everybody in this room. I asked my wife to come today and she said, what's all the talk? I mean, we, we have to have an answer. What, why, why are we talking? And she knows, and, and you know it too, because they're, they're, they're not just the kids at A&M, the 40 kids, but they're kids in middle school and lower school who know and are losing hope. And that's not a good thing for the country. My question is, the politics gets in the way um, the professor on the end made a, one point about it, but you know the way redistricting works keeps the House and the legislature from coming to any answers at all. Because the, when, it, when I talk to the Republican congressman, they will tell you that they'd like to see something done, but they cannot withstand a right-wing attack in a primary. So I give this back to you. 
how do we come to a solution? Not who's right and who's wrong. How do we come to a solution? Silence from the panel um, and the audience. I, I would say, Mike, this. The solutions have to be uh, based not on politics, but on what's best for the country, number one. Uh, what's in the best interest of the country means on an economic front, <coughs> on a social front, on uh, one of one that defines us. My view is we're better, stronger on who we include, not who we exclude. How do we get there? I think Michael might have some comments on the redistricting elements and how that has driven the debate, because what we have seen, there was, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Payan who, who showed the results in the Texas House of Representatives and how they grew. They grew after redistricting. And so the divide has been driven by primary politics and who can get elected in a, in a, uh, in a primary. Correct. Well, yeah, I mean, the literature, the academic literature on the redistricting suggests it's not as much redistricting, but it's the Republican primary, per se. I mean, the, the redistricting plays a role, but it's not the predominant role that often is ascribed to it. That is, if you resolve the redistricting issue uh, and had more competitive districts, that you would uh, get rid of the polarization and extremism. You might do a little bit, but a lot has to do with the Republican primary electorate and the position of the individual politician. So it's not, the remedies aren't as easy. I mean, California's tried with a top two type primary. Uh, the evidence thus far is suggesting that it hasn't been all that successful. That it, if the goal was to moderate politics, that the top two primary, which is the principal solution that's out there where everybody competes and then the two people who uh, get the most votes go on to the general election, that that hasn't really resolved it. Another question here. Well, uh, one of the things I'm most interested in all this is what are the mechanics that are envisioned in the legislation that is being proposed in Washington to solve the problem Mr. Merrick talked about, which is uh, how, how did the, what were they talking about, about taking these 11 million people out of the shadows and even though it's going to be they might take 15 years before they become, quote, citizens and can vote. But I don't. Th I think the idea is that these people would be able to be employed, would be able to have uh, pay Social Security taxes. Their employers would pay Social Security taxes, et cetera, et cetera. They'd be eligible for workers' comp. What is the actual mechanism that's being discussed in Washington? And is it true that, or the, is the, my assumption correct, that the idea is that these these citizens, these residents, would be would be allowed to be given some kind of a uh, recognition that would allow them to come out of the shadows and and uh, become taxpayers and get Social Security, whatever. So the awesome part about today is that this was the preface, um, as was some of the other part of the conference, to the next panel, um, which is going to focus on some of those paths moving forward in terms of the immigration legislation, but I would open it up to... Well, what, what we're hopeful to see is, like, I, I know of several hundred people in my industry that myself and other employers would take right down to the Social Security office or wherever they need to go, register the people, biometrics, fingerprints, background check, enter it into the e-verification system. The e-verification system is, is going to be vital for employers when this thing is done. And, and I think there are employers all over the country that would probably take maybe 50, 75 percent of the undocumented population and overnight put them in a tax-paying role if they could. Is that what's, is that what's envisioned legislation? That's, we should defer the question for later? That, that's both. I mean, yes, that is envisioned and part of it, and we're going to see a lot of it in the next panel discussion, I believe. I think that... You know, there's a, I mean, there obviously a lot of things are being discussed, and part of saving some of those years for some of these people is to uh, put them online, and like uh, Papa Demetriou said, it's going to take a little while, may, maybe 8 to 13 years, different calculations. Uh, but I think then they might shave a couple of years between the green card and citizenship when you can be sworn in. Whether people opt to do it or not, it's a different thing. But at least you shave a couple of years at the end to save up a little bit in the beginning. So it, it, all, this, all these details, I guess, are going to have to be negotiated carefully. Uh, another potential option is essentially to get everybody into a TPS, right, a temporary protected status, so that they can, which some Central Americans already enjoy, 
after Mitch. And uh, that gives you an ID, a driver's license, a social security card. You get to work, you get to go to school, you get to begin to learn English and integrate, and then get in the back of the line. And Do you they keep have that a social TPS. security card that can't be, that is something that's tamper proof? That we haven't so, gotten to the tamper proof oh, no, part. That's, that's a different yet, uh, but, uh, well, Once you get into the e verification system with the, with the photo ID with biometrics, it's going to be pretty hard for that worker. Yeah, because the e-verification system works. People say it doesn't work, but if your data is in the in there, it will work. Now, if somebody steals your data, they, it can be, be be scammed. But if the 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 we have the technology now, retina scans, fingerprint. I mean, we can do everything biometrically. If we turn this thing over to Mastercard or American Express, they'd fix it in a week, <laughs> and they could tell you who's paying taxes and who's not. Yeah, the you way, know, it's, it's the way they do with my credit card right now, where every month I got something on there that's wrong. Yeah. Uh, E-Verify, <laughs> trust but E-Verify. <laughs> E-Verify is not the answer. It's, it's got so many mistakes. Right now it averages about 5% mistakes. And 95% correct. So, Michael, let yeah. me ask you this question, um, and I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll take another question from the audience in a second. But when we look at deferred action, and I don't want to see a failure in Congress, but we obviously had administrative action, and you mentioned 75,000 students. For those in Texas of us, alone. You're right. Um, for those of us that sometimes look out or play from the inside, um, I don't have a crystal ball. I want to see immigration reform pass. Um, I want to see the president sign something into the law that both parties agree on. But let's suppose that that doesn't occur. Um, could the administration, much the way they did with deferred action on students, originally they said they couldn't do this, then they ended up doing it. Could they, they couldn't do it politically. But, but they did it. So could they go forward and manage the undocumented population that you currently have into no. the same system? I, I think that would that that would be perceived as so illegitimate. It's one thing because of the narrative of these sojourner these innocent children who are innocent at least until they turn 18. Chris Kobot says, well, then you got to go back to Mexico, self deport. You know, and Mitt Romney bought that. I mean, that was a platform uh, in the in the party. Um, no, you can't do it with 11 million people because they aren't. Sojourner children, you know, they are they are the parents for the most part who came here illegally, entered without inspection, or who came here legally Never and did said. something to abscond, and that that would not fly. I don't think that you can use deferred action. I mean, you technically could, but it would be suicidal. And already the ICE agents have sued in Dallas court to try and strike down DACA because they said it took away their discretion. Tr ramp that up from the one, point, the 1 million they have here, of which 500,000 have already gone through it, to 11 million. I just think hmm. there would be, there'd be insurrection in the streets. Are there any other questions? So I've been trying to piece together um, some underlying themes from the day to try to get some sort of coherent what we ought to do kind of a message, or at least a coherent problem of why we can't agree on what to do. And um, the professor on the end there brought up something about the Chinese immigrants in the, 18, in the late 1800s, and that kind of brought something to mind. I think the problem is kind of socio-legal. Um, we have kind of an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object, as I see it. Like we have political pressures or ideological pressures, like voters need to feel like their politicians are making them feel safe, so we're building all these fences that don't work. We need to feel like we have national security. We still have racial attitudes about uh, Latinos, which we haven't talked about much today, but that's true. Um, and then that's meeting the economic pressures, like Mr. Merrick was talking about. We, we, we need their labor. We, we like to have them paying taxes, all of our new immigrants. Um, we need more high skills labor, and we know that immigrants are entrepreneurial. And so that's, so that's the immovable object. But those things are fundamentally contradictory. So I think when you have those two things meeting like that in such a contradictory way, we just end up with um, what's known as the chaos of law as a socio-legal term. So I was just wondering how we navigate that chaos of law, kind of confront it, and try to reason through it 
um, with the Chinese and the Chinese Exclusion Act, it kind of took a really long time and it just had to kind of wash over, but I don't think anyone thinks we can wait that long. So um, do we have to reevaluate our um, immovable object, our economic pressures, or do we have to reevaluate our fundamental kind of politi political or ideological pressures that are so deep-seated, our nativism or um, our need to feel like we're being protected, um, our working class people hurting for jobs and feeling like somehow immigrants are taking their jobs away from them. Because those two things are so fundamental <laughs> to our society, yet totally diametrically opposed in so many ways. Sounds like you got a pretty good feel for the problem. You ought to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would probably say that sometimes democracy uh, requires patience and there is a chaos of laws many times, but as Winston Churchill said, you can count on Americans to come through after they've exhausted every option in the book. Um, with that, I don't see any other questions. I know that our time is uh, limited out for this panel. We'll, I believe I'll turn it over to Erica um, and thank you very much to the panelists uh, for their presentation. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break and we'll be right back for the last panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. That was fun. Sí.